while I'm answering you oh. there, right? Well, I just think I'm the camera. <laughs> well, if I thought you were the camera, then I'd look there, and then the TV would see me. Hey, right? no, knock anything over there, buddy. <laughs> Come here. All right. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. <that's> <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I wouldn't worry about that. They're just playing it. All right, well, just be ready to grab him. Right. Things might happen. If he's fast... Uh, it's okay, yeah, it's a, there's editing. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, well, uh, Charles, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to talk about uh, Kevin Spencer and mm -hmm. uh, whatever constitutes a writing career in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, I'm going to try and speak up, so uh, audio, audio picks it up okay. I don't, well, you don't have the boom. Well, first introduce yourself. I mean, oh, hi, I'm Rick Myers. <laughs> Welcome to my house. And, uh, rather disgruntled and disheveled situation here. Uh, you can't see him here, but you might see top of my toddler's head once in a while, and I hope it's his first foray into show business. Um, so yes, I'm honored to... Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Now that that's fixed, uh, what a relief for all of us. Um, Kevin Spencer, uh, I was very fortunate because uh, I've been doing stand-up sort of semi-pro uh, for a couple of years and uh, just sort of touring the, um, excuse me, son, mm -hmm. hello, son, no, <laughs> maybe you can see what mummy's doing upstairs, see if she's got those forgeries finished, all right, <laughs> um, uh, Kevin Spencer was uh, very much a, a, a blessing that came to me from a gentleman named Greg Lawrence, who was the producer of the series. And we'd both been doing stand-up. Uh, I'd been doing it semi-pro in the uh, Montreal, Toronto, uh, Kitchener Triangle, sort of like the Bermuda Triangle, only careers disappear instead. And um, uh, Greg had likewise, but uh, Greg, being much more of a, uh, a financial mind than myself, came to the conclusion that as a producer he could make ten times, twenty times the amount of money uh, trying to produce his own television shows. And uh, at the time, the specialty channels like uh, Comedy Network were hungry for new content. And so uh, Greg uh, approached them with this show idea of his called Kevin Spencer, which involved a somewhat um, delinquent uh, young teen who uh, wears a black baseball cap and uh, runs around doing things like setting fire to um, setting fire to municipal park structures or whatever, but is never, you know, never a particularly, you know, doesn't go out and murder people or anything, at least not on purpose, I don't think. So there still was somewhat of a moral compass that I could embrace and go, okay, well, you know, I've known people like this in my neighborhood who were still friends of mine when I was a kid, but who I know were having a rough time and were setting fire to municipal park structures or parades or whatever. And so they had problems that they had to sort out. Uh, so Greg approached me, uh, knowing that at the time that I also did uh, work at a, an advertising agency where we wrote copy uh, for radio and television. And... Um, uh, asked if I'd be interested in uh, working for the show, and I was thrilled. So um, I signed on board and uh, wrote uh, sometimes eight to twelve episodes a year, and uh, we went for eight years, which was uh, I, I think still maybe a, a Canada's longest running animated uh, comedy series. So um, it's kind of a, a neat, if not dark, legacy. Uh, one of the things I loved most about Kevin Spencer was it, get, it, it gave an opportunity to. Uh, showcase sort of some of the, the weirder experiences of growing up like in a West End of uh, a city like Ottawa. Um, certain delinquent things were very much drawn from actual experiences in my life. Uh, some that I, I'm not super proud of. Let's see, um, there was an episode um, where Kevin Spencer and his dad do their annual Christmas traditional thing, which is uh, go to the church with a big ba basket of snowballs and uh, fling open the doors while everyone's singing carols inside and just pegs them all with snowballs while they're inside the church. Um, very, uh, some thought controversial episode, but we actually did that. It wasn't me and my dad, it was me and a bunch of the idiots from the neighborhood, but um, yeah, just one year we just flung open the doors and opened fire with snowballs and probably knocked some wigs off and probably wasn't the nicest thing to do, but you know, in your teens, what do you want? Um, we, uh, strangely, if you want to see that actual episode in Spanish, Kevin Spencer is uh, on YouTube a lot. We were very popular in Spain for some reason. And uh, that episode where, where the church gets nailed with snowballs is uh, a popular item in, in Spain, so I'm thrilled. Um, another episode uh, I wrote dealt with um, this tow truck driver character. And um, he, uh, he was based on a real guy. And it was a case of a guy, uh, the tow truck company he worked for was under contract with the police. 
so that meant his uh, trucks were always the first ones on the scene after a terrible accident, a collision or anything like that. And um, over the course of several years, the gentleman who was, you know, a relatively average working class dude started to get very emotionally twisted by what he'd see and how dark uh, his, his own personality would become from seeing horrible things. And um, uh, one time uh, near the end, uh, where he finally quit, um, uh, the police had already removed most of the bodies from a, a automotive collision, uh, and as he towed up the car and lifted it up, uh, the head of somebody fell off, bonk, because it had been stuck between the roof of the overturned car and the road, and so uh, no one had seen it. They'd searched the bushes. They, the head's missing. We gotta find the head, and they searched the bushes and everything. Couldn't find it. Well, it had been underneath the vehicle, and as soon as he lifted up the the car, um, and uh, that was near the end. He soon just gave it up and, and went on to a career as a getting unemployment checks and drinking too much, and that's the last I heard of him actually. But that was a real guy, and so I turned that into a character called Lomax or Cousin Lomax in Kevin Spencer, and then I I added too much stuff to it because Kevin was the weird, you know, cousin or whatever. So. Uh, I added to that horrible story by uh, having Kevin find the head and in twisted teen fashion deciding to keep it, uh, sort of as, you know, kids take home stuff, construction signs, uh, lights, whatever, put them in their room. So he kept the head and put it in his room, and that was uh, um, not a popular decision. His dad got very upset because the smell was scaring away all the hookers, and um, so Kevin finally decided to do the right thing and brought the head to the funeral where people were burying the rest of the body and he whipped this out uh, at the appropriate time and more scandal and horror so he ran away and decided just to leave the head hanging from uh, the tongue in the backyard off a tree as a bird feeder where it uh, ended up finally sort of the final shot of the whole episode so a bit grim and certainly my, my twisted additions to it uh, didn't uh, exactly add any kind of pixie dust or, or sugar coating. And um, uh, that episode got CTV in a bit of trouble. Uh, they, it, the episode was banned. I have a copy somewhere, but I, I'm sorry, I don't know where. Uh, and uh, um, and so CTV the next week had to put a formal apology uh, in the time slot, rolling up the screen. Last week, we blah, blah, blah. CTV would like to apologize. And then, I think unfairly, because this was all based on one letter. They only got one letter of complaint about that from one person, and uh, uh, on a, as a result of that one person, and I'll grant you, it was the edgier of the edgy shows, all right, but that one person makes a whole network grind to a halt and throw up all kinds of apologies and things. I mean, my God, millions of dollars, like, th this is commerce, this is capitalism, not the way I understand it, I'm sorry. So, um, that was all very interesting. Um, Otherwise, uh, Kevin Spencer continued to be just a, a wonderful, uh, um, it, it, it was the dream gig because, I mean, you're basically working for a month and a half early in the year and then you're done and you've made enough money for the rest of the year to live and not, not Rockefeller, not Bill Gates rich, but, you know, uh, I, I was told I was being paid more than a doctor, so that's kind of neat. Um, and, uh, uh. Basically, like anything, like any uh, television, when it's the risk of working in this industry, is the uh, you know the, the good projects, like the bad projects, they come and they go. I mean, television shows don't last forever, and you can't work on it and then go, I'm going to retire on this thing, har, har, har. Um, so uh, luckily, I'd been planning on that and knew that was going to happen and sort of made forays into investigating other careers and things to work on. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, it was right around, just around 2005, Kevin Spencer finally wrapped up its final production, and uh, they let me write myself into the final episode, so, or second final episode, sorry, Greg wrote the final episode. Um, the second final episode, I got to sort of have a cameo character role that went throughout the episode, and that was a, a real honor and kind of neat. Um, it was interesting also as a work experience because as the writer... Uh, like when Greg approached me, he wondered if I wanted to come into their uh, studio to work and, uh, you know, be part of the production system. And I didn't, uh, it sounds strange to say, I didn't cotton to that because it was two bus rides. 
I would have had to transfer from two buses. And it sounds stupid to say now. I mean, if I'd known how much of a gig it would have been, I'm sure I would have traveled. I, but at the time, I thought, huh, how long is this gig going to last? Who knows? So I go, can I just send it in? Like, can I? do I have to come in? You know, like, it's two bus trips. I mean, uh, I'll be on time. I'll meet deadlines. You won't have any problems there. But I, I just, I'm not going to ride the bus <coughs> that far. I ride the bus every day, but I wouldn't ride it that far. And he said, sure. So that was even more flexible of him because, frankly, uh, in retrospect, maybe you should have been offended. So, what, what, I'm offering you a gig and you're just, <laughs> I'm not going to take the bus? What is that? But, um, and it also created an interesting detachment because uh, I, love the, I love the many talented people who worked on the show, but uh, I only went in once every few months to sign documents and do some voiceovers for peripheral characters of security guard or, you know, strip club DJ or something, you know. And, um, so you do that and uh, everyone kind of looks at you, but uh, you don't have that same sort of workplace bonding moment or things that uh, you might have in another typical nine to five job where you find out what Ed thinks of the water cooler or uh, who Joanne's sleeping with on the photocopier machine, you know, so. Um, but it was still very nice and the Christmas parties were outstanding. Uh, no, like, no complaints on that count, the perks of the job with respect to, you know, wow, a Christmas party with a live band? Wow, you know, like, um, that, sort of, that sort of thing was always great. Uh, the unfortunate part, uh, not so much for me as for the whole community in Ottawa, is that Greg, uh, a great producer, um, but unfortunately just both the economy and the uh, television industry is in a, such a state of flux, if you will, that he uh, fluxed off to uh, Toronto, uh, where uh, there's more work, and uh, uh, still sort of gets in touch and, and wanna, you know hangs out for beer and things, but I think the bulk of his, what he's doing these days is occurring in T.O., so... Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we keep hoping for another level and a new generation, and there's always people trying to start things off. I mean, Greg at one time was the new guy, and uh, we have new, new guys trying out every day. So we'll see what, uh, what uh, comes out of the compost of the last generation. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of ideas. That's yeah, all good. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Uh, so uh, essentially how I got involved in writing, um, much like many people, I uh, first attended Algonquin College because I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life and uh, uh, entered the broadcasting program because I figured something in the arts maybe and um, uh, was considered that uh, I was going to be working in graphics because I did some, you know, kind of not bad base level graphic stuff. This is pre-computer uh, graphics, just to give you a sign of my age, but the computer graphics hadn't really reached their ascendancy yet. And, uh, I kind of bristled at that because, I mean, I knew I was okay with graphics and that's fine, but it wasn't really, I knew that I didn't really want to just focus on that. So I knew I liked comedy and uh, shows like, uh, like Kids in the Hall, uh, Monty Python, things like that, and um, got uh, uh, very, very, uh, while working in a gas bar to pay my college tuition, uh, enjoyed listening to a, a local comedy troupe on the radio on Shea 106 called Skid Row, and uh, they had this thing called Buzz the Skid Row Trooper, who was this wacky uh, voice uh, of some sort of noid type thing that floated around and did crazy, crazy junk. And I really liked that, and they had, suddenly one day they're, they're having a contest. Yes, if you want to write a sketch comedy bit for our comedy troupe. Well, this was very exciting to me, like so much so I wrote like seven sketches back to back, and belched them out, threw them in a threw them in a, a priority courier package and sent them to uh, uh, Skid Row and uh, lost, I actually came in second. Um, and that was okay though, because, uh, uh, no, actually, you know what, it wasn't okay, no. <laughs> I would have liked the computer prize, that was great, but I have to admit, the prize winning sketch was really something, like the guy, the guy who wrote it was this very, very hyper intelligent, uh, worked at a, one of our national banks, very very wealthy genius guy and and I bow to his Jeopardy sketch. It was a good sketch and it ran for many years with the company. Um, and for this he won, first prize was a, uh, what was it called, uh, an Apple computer, uh, which in 1988-89 was, what? 512k? Who could ever need so much memory? Uh, it, that was an age where that was. I, I carry the size of advanced computers from the 80s on a gig stick now in my pants. But um, this was amazing at that time, and uh, so I got the uh, uh, second place. And second place uh, was basically 
uh, no prize, but to uh, come out and see the show and see a couple of your sketches produced, and, and that was a thrill. Um, but then they wanted to offer a writing job to the winner. Now the winner, as I mentioned before, was this multi-million dollar banker guy who said, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, no offense, guys. I make 300000 a year. Uh, I'm not going to come work for you in Canadian entertainment because I know how much you guys really make. Um, and uh, they said, okay, no harm, thanks, enjoy the computer. And instead hired me, the uh, keen go-getter student at the time who uh, was willing to do, uh, you know, take co-op money, which was half subsidized by the government, half by them, to come in and uh, write what I can, uh, clean out whatever toilets I could, and, uh, you know, do a lot of the grunt work that the new guy always has to do. And uh, it was awesome. It was a golden age uh, in my 20s. And sort of, wow. So every, uh, now, Skid Row had just, just finished doing the uh, weekly, uh, every uh, weekend in a basement show at uh, the Bytown, what is now the Bytown Tavern on Elgin. And instead we're trying to stage every three or four months a big new show that would run for a couple of weeks at, say, the NAC or uh, the Great Canadian Theatre Company, the old one, or some larger venued show. That way, uh, you know, generating more income and also having a bigger thing going on. Um, so I saw their York Street Theatre show, I think was the first one. And then from York Street Theatre, uh, NAC, did a couple of shows at the NAC, that was really cool. Um, they also did actually this sort of um, comedy comedy rock and roll show with the uh, Ottawa band at the time called Eight Seconds, who had two big hits with Where's Beulah and uh, Progresso Expresso. Um, very 80s music, but they were our big band in, uh, in the 80s here. And so it was like a rock and roll comedy thing. It was, it was really a, a big deal. Um, but like anything, I mean, Skit Row uh, went for a number of years after I joined, but a lot of the guys by that point were starting to reach uh, their 30s and sort of say to themselves, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not making a lot of money at this and I want to have a family and settle down and maybe sell insurance or something, which is a reasonable thing at that, you know, when you reach those turning points in your life, you got to make the decisions, you know, sort of, hmm. Uh, we, we had gone on an upward trajectory with our, uh, with our uh, uh, troupe and all that with uh, a couple of TV pilots, but uh, I think our last kick of the can on the TV pilot game was a, uh, the time we did, uh, we, were, we were usurped, if you will, by a, a troupe called uh, Kids in the Hall. And again, where I have to bow and acquiesce, I think they were doing amazing stuff and certainly were the more deserving troop. But uh, it's a shame. We, you know, I, I thought if we could have held it together and sort of found our voice, uh, you know, we might still be around today. Or, or at least, uh, oh God, well, some of them would kill me for saying that, actually. Um, some of them actually went on to very lucrative careers. Uh, Derek Diorio is an award-winning director, um, making a lot of money directing some very, very lucrative uh, dramatic series, especially in Quebec. Um, Le, Le Météo, uh, Le Franqueur, uh, shows that, uh, you know, uh, certainly taking care of him very well. Um, uh, and some of the guys, you know, did just sort of go on to more normal stuff. Ironically, one of the most successful uh, people in Skid Row, Rick Curry, was their uh, technical booth guy. He was uh, the guy who when Skid Row did a show, would push the lighting buttons and the lighting cues and things. Well, he's now like one of the, the big up-and-coming stand-up comics who's uh, just uh, appeared in like his third episode of The Debaters on CBC Radio. He's had a number of comedy now, uh, uh, co um, uh, CBC Comics. Um, used to write for The Mike Bullard Show. Um, and even he sort of grins and goes, yeah, I know that doesn't, some people hated that show, but still, yeah, okay. But still, it's a network show, you know. And so, uh, ironically, he was the guy in the back room in the booth putting on the wigs and helping people with their shoes, and uh, he ended up being the big cheese, you know, so uh, I think that's hilarious. Um, and that's pretty much the Skid Row story. I mean, from there I, I got into the stand-up pretty much uh, going semi-pro for a bit, and uh, sort of picked that up uh, talking about Greg Lawrence and those guys. And, uh, but that's pretty much the Skid Row story. The only ironic ending to that is now the space that used to belong to Skit Row's improv troupe comedy is now owned by Yuck Yucks. As of about a month ago, Yuck Yucks moved out of its old sp space it had held for 25 years on Albert Street and is now in the basement of the Bytown Tavern. 
And that's uh, sort of, wow, what a, what a comedy loop, which 90% of the people in the world wouldn't give a damn about, I agree. But me, it's like, wow, I, as Ottawa trivia, what do you know? You know? So uh, that was that's about all I can give you about the stand-up anyway for now. Oh, oh yeah. I don't know. I, <laughs> let's see. Hang on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Funny stand-up stories, maybe. Mm. Sweet. <laughs> well, no, I shouldn't tell this one. Let's see. Uh, nah. <laughs> nah, Larry Horowitz would sue me. But Larry Horowitz, he's the only comic I knew who shit his pants on stage. Uh, he was, uh, he, he'd, eaten, uh, he'd eaten a bad salad or something that gave him the runs and uh, he did this bit where he, he does this joke where you put a, well, he impersonates what it would look like if you had a blood pressure gauge around your neck, like, mm -hmm. and he does yeah. a very funny face. Yeah. But the problem is when you have a flu and you've eaten a bad salad, that kind of pressure is bad news, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> he did it. And then, <laughs> <laughs> you hear a sort of a fart, farty sound, and then he suddenly quickly starts to excuse himself from the stage. And, well, that's all for tonight. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Good night. Good night. And he's going off, and this caught the MC off guard because he's thinking, oh, Larry's still got 10 minutes. What's yeah. uh, MC runs on stage and goes, Oh, but gee, Larry. <laughs> you know, like this. And uh, Larry, a consummate professional, uh, went to the bathroom, uh, got out of his. Uh, feces stained underwear, wiped his butt with his shirt, and went back on stage to do the last 10 minutes of his show without his shirt, and explained apparently to the audience everything that had just happened, and was quite open about it. I imagine they thought it was a bit when it happened initially, anyways. <laughs> oh, well, you yeah. know. Uh, it would have to be a good bit if you could smell it. I don't know, but a legendary show. Um, I love stand-up. I love anybody, like one of the the good reason to be in showbiz is that's where the stories are. They're, they're always entertaining. There's always something weird going on or something blowing up, and then you don't know how the sh actual show got done anyway. And um, uh, that movie Shakespeare in Love talked about it. You know, it's like, the, sh the, show will, the show will be fine. They go, but how? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it'll be fine, but it, it'll be fine. Um, uh, having said that, I'm now drying up on hilarious stand-up stories, but, you know, uh, really the only reason, I, I make a joke about this, but one of the best reasons I got into this business was the parties, because um, maybe maybe working in a cubicle is a fine life for a lot of people, and they deserve it uh, to work, they deserve respect for working hard and supporting their kids and, and whatever, but... Uh, it's for it's sort of a frightening place for me, but you know what? Uh, being a doctor would be a lucrative place for me too, and I'm frightened of that too. And thank heavens there are doctors because we need them, but I just know I couldn't do it. So uh, it's all sort of choosing where you think you are most appropriate in the world. I guess. Hmm. Is any of this being recorded? No. <laughs> no, that would suck. If it was just me talking to myself. Nah. Oh man, good therapy. Yeah. I, guess, but... I don't know. Yeah, I could have been a therapist.